Many of you are familiar with uh, Agda, Icarus, and Koch, and the other various embedded type languages. Uh, well, a lot of those features that have been developed there are starting to make their way to Haskell. Uh, it's really exciting because there's a lot of opportunities to do more with the type system than we had in the past. Uh, the group guys were the guys uh, lead the chart on that. So it's going to be very clear to him how that's going. Great, thank you. Um, is, this, is this picking me up? That's oh, great, okay. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so first off, thanks so much for, for coming out tonight on uh, Friday night in the um, um, so, uh, what, what I want to do is actually sort of talk, um, this talk is going to be broken into two parts, uh, and I think we'll appreciate some of the in the two parts. Um, and so first I want to talk a lot about uh, dependent types in Haskell today. So, um, you know, you can think about these other languages, you know, Agda and Interest and Cock, and these are dependent type languages. Actually, my point is, Haskell is already dependent. Um, and, and we're going to go through a bunch of examples of how that works. And in particular, um, uh, my, my goal for this first half of the talk is, uh, is, to, is to sort of convince you that Haskell has dependent types, and dependent types are useful for doing real work. Um, I really try to choose my examples so that these are things where it's a proper road, and we can actually get more work done because of dependent types. Um, and, and so that's, and the only way to make that claim, right, is a bunch of examples, and so that's what we're going to see. Um, I should also point out that my goal is not to teach everyone in an hour how to depend on that program. Right? So um, the, the example, because of sort of the six or seven of them, we're going to have to be fairly quick to each one. And again, the goal is to give you a sense of what's possible, and maybe some time you need to start learning. Um, as you can see, all of the code that we're going to see is up on GitHub, so you can use this as a template to start from, um, and we uh, you know what this is there. Do be in touch. I mean, I'm all that kind of type of in Haskell. If you want to do that, especially if you're going to do that, do something real, like it also be part of the product, or you can do all the work in this. Okay, so with that introduction, you can hold back the first half of the talk to me. So, um, uh, I, I said at the beginning that Haskell is a dependent type language, always. Um, and in my, uh, what I mean by that is that there, there are two hallmarks that I see in a dependent type language. Um, and, and they are that when you do pattern match, you learn something interesting. And there's something interesting about your types. Right? So, if you, if you do a case match in Haskell, then you learn something about the types. And the answer is yes. If you use indeed these teachers, um, there are that way of getting as you can see in the same way. Um, uh, and I'm always just going to say that that might just be something that people say and on the rest of the world. It's doing great. Um, and, oh, but, but, by the way, I realize maybe some of you know, there's a hall, there's a few people here that know there's a hall, I think that I don't know. Just to give you a little I'm writing a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. And really in Haskell model. It's essentially what you're seeing is some things, some of the um, So, um, let's see, so that's like, right, two hallmarks of those type of things. One is that matching gives you a great type of And the other is you can have functions from types. So you can do some kind of things from types. And so, the first example is right here. Um, this is not a lot of it right, all the things. But it shows these two it shows these two aspects of dependent okay. Um, it shows these two aspects of, of dependent type in Haskell. Um, and so we have this generalized array of data type. Um, just to sort of give me an idea, who here has used GATs in Haskell program? Okay, so I say about half. Great. Um, so this is, this is a, a data type. Um, it declares a couple of constructors. It has a different syntax than we might be used to for a normal data type. Um, in that, we explicitly give the return type uh, of each constructor. So, so here, um, gint is not just any ga. It's specifically a gint. Um, and mgrule is not any ga. It's specifically a grule. 
So even though these data constructors don't sort of carry any traditional information, um, uh, we'll see cases where you do have that, that, that store fields. Uh, but we can actually get something useful from this. So I want to look at this max function here. Uh, so here, this is sort of a odd thing that's going on. In that, we get the type of GA to A. So it looks like this should be equal to for any A. But then when I pattern match on the data constructors of G, I learn something about A. And so here, in the first line, in the G int, I now know, because I have a G int, I know that A must be here. And so that's what I was referring to earlier when I said you get information about types in pattern matching on terms. And that means in the right hand side, I can, I can say fine. Well, just in case anyone doing this, um, this, I mean, this, this does actually be possible. Um, Um, so yes, yeah, so all of the examples that, that I show in the first episode, these are all real examples that actually be a few times. Um, uh, so I'm using HD783, there are a bunch of features in 7 that I'm using, although the guy has been around since the 60s. Um, so um, we have that, and then the next line of math. Now, because I, I, I see that my G is actually a be bool, I know that A must be bool, and so I can, I can produce false. And without this technique, that there's no way of writing a function like this. It can return different types of different scenarios. So, so that's, that's the first aspect of the kind of type programming. Pattern matching gives us information that we can use in the right hand side of the pattern. And as it's done in Pascal, um, this, this works in both case statements and, and in function um, calls. And so, and then the other aspect is computation types. So how many people in here have ever used a type family or an associated type? Okay, fewer. I'm not, I'm not surprised. So we'll go to the next step after that. Um, and so this, all this really does is define a function on types. Um, so we have the, the type family problem. And how much can so type family is a Haskell name for this thing. Um, and there's a historical good theory reasons for that. But um, we can just really think of this as a function on types. And so this is a function that takes types and returns types. So here, problem is the type car. And problem will is the type soon. And so now in the prob function, uh, I can take the GA and return a problem A. And now there's all sorts of good things going on, right? So if I know that A is in, by doing a pattern match here, we know that this G is actually a G hint. So we know that A is hint. Well, prob hint, we see on line 20 there, is, is just car. So I can return a character. And then similarly on the next line, when I learn that A must be a rule, then I can return a um, And again, this, this type checks. And so, so this is computation in types. Uh, and even though I'm not using this example, this is useful. To me, if a language can do this, then you can say that the language is dependent on type. Because the types, at least on the right hand side of the pattern map, really do depend on what we what we what we've done in the problem. Um, so before we go any further, so this isn't an aspect of what I say the kind of types are. Um, a few things uh, that, that sort of take me a long time to understand is few things that dependent types are not, I think might be important. Um, so one thing, the dependent type is not a type. They depend on runtime values. Right? Sort of, I, I had that in my head for a while, that, that sometimes you have, you have a type depending on some data that you've got at runtime, right? But that doesn't make any sense, that requires time trial. Because types are used statically at compile time. How can we know anything about runtime at compile time? So that's, that's not what it is. Um, you can also think of a type as sort of depending on terms in some way, and that's maybe closer to it. But to me, still, that's not really it, because here we, we don't have any of that. We're not using data, the data economy extension. We're not promoting anything. And yet, we're still doing really interesting things in type, even in this small thing. Um, and, and so, uh, it, that's just another thing to be aware of. That it's not necessarily type depending on current. This type information is depending on current information, more than on current variety. Another thing that it's not is, uh, dependent types are not exclusively when you have the same language for types as you do for terms. So in active cognitive, you use the exact same syntactic constructs and types that you do in terms. 
you have to, you don't do this, and all of my work is not leading toward that. Um, but that doesn't make Haskell not dependent on type, because it's still a separate. Um, and then the last thing is dependent type is not a very precise term at all. And, and so my definition, you could come and tell you people in the room who, who really disagree with something I said, and then that's great you can have the video. Um, I don't think there's one who really comes there to say exactly what it is and what it is. So you can sort of choose in some of these definitions and have some fit. Um, but I don't think there's anything. Um, okay, so, so from this simple example, let's let's go to a, a, a real life example, something that I was actually working on this class. Um, and that's that's template castle. Um, so once again, so how many people in here use template castle? Okay, more. Uh, so let's say I want to write a function here, all names bound x. I want to write this function that finds every name that's bound in an expression. Not every name that's used. But only those that are bound somewhere in the structure. Um, and, and so I have, I have to write this awfully large, uh, sort of mutually recursive set of functions that do it on every different piece of template Haskell that exists. Um, so those of you who haven't used template Haskell, template Haskell, um, among other things, has a representation of the Haskell language in Haskell data sets. So, um, but one thing I can ask is, is for information about expressions. And so here, this data type allows us to encode, you can have variable, but you know, variable is an expression. A data constructor is an expression. You can have literal or, or expressions. You can apply one expression to another. And so, again, this is to just give you a sense of what we're talking about. This is just a data type that describes Haskell expressions. Um, but of course, an expression, in a case statement, right? A case statement is going to be matches. And um, it's going to be much more surprised, but if you look at what's here in max, all well, max includes a pack pattern, right? So there's all these different data types and they're all mutually recursive. And so that's why I have a whole lot of functions to do this proposal. Now, one thing that's included in expressions is declarations. Um, you have a left expression, and there's a bunch of declarations in the left expression. And so I want to look at this. And now if you look down here, all of the different types of declarations, well, there's a whole lot of declarations in that set, only some of which make any sense inside of a web. Um, so, um, so finally, that's, that's to declare a new function. So well, that's certainly a lot of Value is to declare a new value. Um, but then data D, that defines a new data type. And Haskell doesn't have that. No you can't have a sort of local data type in um, And yet this dec type in template Haskell has all of these constructors. And so it means that when I'm writing all names down the left deck, uh, it, it means that I have to know an awful lot of Haskell language to know what constructors I need to worry about here and what I definitely don't need to worry about. Um, and so when I compile this, let me see the one in the there's a GHC complaint, well, there's a bunch of pattern matches that I haven't done here. Right? I haven't handled the data in case. Because GHC doesn't know that the data keys can't be inside of what declaration. There's no way for it to know that. Right? These are just ordinary data sets. Um, and, and so I get this one, and that's bad. So what I could do is I could have a catch all case at the bottom and say that this is an error, but that's sometimes a set. Um, and it also means that, let's say there's a new kind of declaration that happens in a new version of GHC, all the time, um, it means that I won't get any warning when I don't handle that case. And so that means that. Uh, or I can go and enumerate all of them and then error on each one, so that we get a warning if a new declaration edit. But, but maybe, for example, I don't know that I can have an infix, a fixity declaration in the middle of a line. Turns out that you can. I guess it's not everyone knows that who's using template Haskell. And so, so you can sort of have errors in either direction. Um, and so, get it can fix this problem. Um, and so, this is the proposed redesign of template Haskell. Um, and, and just to sort of drive the point on, this is not 
some an example I put together for this talk. This is actually something that my goal is PhD seven ten. Um, but to actually make the depth type of template Pascal, um, a, a data so that you can you can sort of have minor control patterns. And so this this is actually taken. This, this is not exactly the, the file that, that is internal to GHC, but this is some edits in here. But you can see all of these different data types. You know, there's a whole bunch of different types of patterns. So the one I'm going to look at is that um, And so to make this a little bit understandable, um, what, what, what I've noticed is that there's four different places the declarations can appear in Haskell. They can appear at the top all, they can appear inside of class declaration, they can appear inside of the instance declaration, and they can appear inside of a lot. And those are the only four places that Haskell allows these declarations. Uh, well, in, in uh, considering where clauses are sort of the same as left today and the same set of uh, And so at B, these, uh, these four data types, uh, which are all just sort of rules, right? It's just, you know, they just sort of code yes or no. But to do so in a way that you can have a better error, it's still working. Uh, so then I, uh, make this new data type depth context, which just two pulls these four up, right? Because the idea is that we want to be able to say to each declaration what context it can appear in. And there's no sort of ordering relationship between these. It's not that if it can appear in one place, it can definitely appear in another. Each declaration has its own pattern. So we really need to sort of track these four different rulings with the separate each declaration. Um, and so all this depth context does is just two more of So now we have all four of them in one. Um, and we'll come back to these types of things in a bit. So let's look at, say, fund. So, so fund B, that's a, that's a function declaration. And that can appear in any of these contexts. Um, the only one that might be a little surprised is, like, they can, they can have a function declared inside of class, which is a default implementation of a class. Right. So in the other context, I think it's fun. Uh, and so here, what it's saying is that a funding, given the name of the function and the list of its clauses, is a deck for any, for whether or not it's a top level thing, and whether or not it's inside of the class, and whether or not it's in the and whether or not it's in the um, So these are just four type variables that can freely range over the different sort of Boolean flags that I've created. Um, so, so one, one other thing that's going on here, I'm using the data kinds extension, right? This is sort of weird. I've declared this a data type. And so we normally think of GC as a data constructor term level thing. Um, and here I'm actually using a type. You can say this sort of looks like a term appearing a type, but it's a bit of a lock. Because all it does is ask all, when you say that the data kinds extension, when you say uh, data that context equals DC and this is stuff. Actually creates two totally separate unrelated things that have to have the same names. We get the type deck context with a data constructor DC, but we also get a kind deck context with a type constructor DC. Um, and so we can actually see this when we go to this file. This is slower on the AD. And so I can ask for the time of DC. And now DC here is considered to be a type with a rather interesting time. Um, so how many of you have either seen or worked with data times? Okay, okay. So if you remember, there's actually not terribly much deep and amazing about data times. It just allows you to do sort of type level programming that's, that's well timed. Um, for a long time, you could sort of do this kind of trick, but everything just ended up to be another type of structure that you would declare. And, and then if you used the wrong one in the wrong context, you didn't get any sort of component of it. Uh, and now with data kind, you can do this in a slightly more low kind of way. So I can't index that by int, for example, because I have the wrong name. Uh, I can change this to different kind of stuff so it's more of a type. Whereas if I fully apply DC, Context. Uh, okay, 
So, um, so that's what clumsy means. So clumsy means that any choice of whether it's top or not, any choice of class, any choice of class, any choice of class, a clumsy is done. And we can contract that to KDB. Um, the pure KDB is, well, for any choice of whether it's top or not, of course it's always going to be top because it turns out to be a better than top or not. But it definitely can't be in a class, and it definitely can't be in a class, and it definitely can't be in a class. Um, and so that's helpful. And we can look at some more obscure cases. Um, in that, I don't know if you're anywhere, but in an instance declaration, you can't have a fixed declaration inside of an instance. That really wouldn't make any sense to have something for those in there. But actually, you can put a fixed declaration inside of a class, even though it means the exact same thing if you put it outside of a class. Um, but has to let you do this, and so I want to reflect that in the um, So, with all of this, let me switch over the usage. Now, if I go up to the top here and get rid of these functions, and instead use my own operator, now we don't get any warnings. Yes? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I guess if you, you could have mentioned right now, Gates doesn't have any ability to the type level blanks or wild cards. And so we have to do it. Um, the, a different, yes, we're going to have underscores in types, but you would have a different meaning. Absolutely. Yeah, this isn't looking good. Uh, but then you can ask a question. Now I'm happy to any time you can raise your hand. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so because of the, this extra information, now over here I don't get any warnings. And in fact, it, if I go down here, you do that, and I try to compile. Ooh. Couldn't match yes and left with no anymore. Um, and so it doesn't like scream at you, the data these do not exist in left hand. It's pretty close. Um, and, and so, so this is again the power get. So now I, I've made my template Haskell code a little bit more type and a little bit more stable when it changes. Because now that the template Haskell changes, I get warnings if I'm missing things or errors or something that's been removed from my template. So that's that's really useful. Uh, just sort of one other little point here to drain this. Um, um, is uh, uh, so here now I have to use this type of let that, which fixes the value of of, of these instances here. So I said it's not anywhere but no one. Um, and so, because no, so here, because my all means that let that takes a let that. We know that it's taking something yes and right. And so here you see, you do all the matching. Sure Any questions on this example before you run over? Yes. So, no, it wouldn't have. So, like, funding would occur in any And that's okay because what will happen is that these can be any of these variables can be anything. And so, we'll just get chosen for it. Oh, uh, yes, I guess we would. If it's that, and if I get rid of that one, and I'm going to try to compile. So we get the warning and tell us it's happy with this. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on. So, uh, so this is actually a module that's in base in 7.8. Right now, you can use this today. It's called data.type.poly. Um, 
Um, and it defines, this is actually, I haven't modified this file at all for this presentation. Um, it defines this very particular get it. Um, in some sense, this is like the canonical get it that powers them all. If you only had this one, you could do all of the others with a lot of these things. Um, and so what it does is if, um, I guess it's propositionally equal. So if A is propositionally equal to B, or the, the type A is, is, is propositionally equal to B, is inhabited by one constructor which forces the two type indices to be the same. And so if I have two different types, but I know that they're propositionally equal because I have a, um, I have a piece of data, I have a, a term of this type around, and I pattern that on, then GHC will know, well, they're not two different types, they're the same. Um, so we can do some pretty cool things down here. So let's look at cast width for a second. So in cast width, I get evidence that A and B are the same, and an A. And I want to return a B. Well, of course I can. Because I just do a pattern match, I get REFL out. And when I see REFL, then I know actually A and B are the same. And so that means I can just return this. And that works just fine. Uh, and then we also have key cast width, which is a little bit more powerful, but has worse inference properties. Um, so that, that's why we have both. But this one is wrong. And G cast width um, takes a sort of a notion of a, a proof of equality between A and B. And any computation that must assume somewhere that A equals B. And the type of that computation is equal. And then we'll, we'll produce that R by sort of feeding in that R. Um, and so essentially, when we use gcast with the second argument is gcast with, we can just blindly assume that A equals B and do whatever it needs to do. Um, and that will work. Um, and so this is using sort of higher rank types and things. And again, this is a little bit deeper. There's not going to be a grand example of this. So, um, and again, this, this shows how do you follow through. I do have an example of using follow through, though. And that is. Okay. Um, and so here, uh, the idea the idea here is that I want to have some data type that represents an Haskell types. Um, and this is not just something that you know as programming language people like to do. This is actually useful. This is essentially what type wrap and type of do. Um, so so maybe you see some type of constraints floating around in various programs. Well, the idea of a type of constraint. It carries one kind of type information. And so maybe there's some part of your program you can whatever you see, you can't type statically. So you might carry around these type of constraints so you can learn the type of And one place that this is actually really useful is, is in implementing cloud Haskell, where we want to be able to send things across the network. And some of these send type information with those things. Um, and so this, this example that you see here is kind of directly inspired by practical needs in the implementation of cloud Haskell. Um, so here, uh, I've had, this is sort of like a type rep. The difference between this and the real type rep is that this one is indexed by, by the parameter. Um, although, um, right now we're working in ways of actually making the real type rep also indexed. Um, so this is another get. Um, and it's sort of straightforward in some way that if we get the data constructor tying it, well, now we know that that index is really true. Well, we know it's full of it could be a string. But we can also do higher kind of uh, types here, and that's just fine. Um, so if we see that there is um, if a list, well, there's going to be some type of being in the list. But we know that these are higher types. Uh, there's other type indexes are list of these type indexes. So those are the A, B, C, D, E. And with power of those two. There's actually nothing harder about List and arrow are going to be other types. Um, it's pretty really interesting, and it just works without um, And so, here, what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to compute correlation types. And so, what I mean by that is that if two of these one time type representations, um, I can actually learn essentially a sort of a compile time type of quality. So, because I'm handling all the cases, again, we're not actually taking data from one. 
We're just considering all possible cases. Um, and so here, in all the cases that they match, we're going to produce a level. Right? I'm in the baby moment here, so we're going to look at going to match. Um, and in the, in the last case, when things don't match up, well, that's just nothing. We don't have a proof that A equals B, so that's not the um, And so I just want to sort of walk through exactly what's going on in, say, just the simplest case right here. So I've taken these two tyros, both of them have turned out to be primes. So that means we can look at our type. And so this A, I've learned that what really must be E. This B really must be E. And so on the right hand side here, when I say REPL, all I'm doing is producing a proof that N equals N. Of course it equals N, so that fixes it. If on the other hand, by the way, it does. Uh, if I change this, I do the wrong thing, and say that I want the n equals rule, well, that's not going to work. Because you can't act rule with it. Right? Because now, as I've written it right here, I know that a is in, b is rule. But REPL, REPL is only a proof that some type equals itself. Not a, not a proof that n equals b. So this REPL fails to occur. So I had to adopt this one. Um, okay, so, so given that, now I want to take this idea and be able to have a dynamically type in. So the dynamic wraps up some datum of type A along with its type. And so this is something. Notice that dynamic itself is not type in it. This is its essential type. Um, and so this might be something that we can then push over a network and at the other end read in the type information. And then learn what type A is, and then type A quite in time. Uh, and so, yeah? Sure. Yes. Yeah, that would. In fact, the only part of this that doesn't work with the real type pool is the fact that type pool is color kinded. Um, and to do this with the real type pool, we need kind of qualities. Which GHC doesn't have. Yeah. Although that's like on the train right home tonight, I'll be working with the data kind of quality. It's nice happening. I guess so. Um, but this is very close to possible. Uh, so, um, so here in Dynamic File, I want to do take two of these dynamically type things. And if the types are all appropriate, I want to apply the first one to the second one. And so here I'm going to pattern that. And I want to get the arrow type. Out of my first uh, dynamic. And, and then here, so I can match that, so I know actually that this type index A sort of isn't named down here. Uh, you know that has to be uh, a function type from the type represented by TR to the type represented by TRES. Over here, the other dynamic I'm unpacking, I'm going to get that has the type T. And I need to check, does the argument equal, does the argument type of the function equal the type of the argument? And we want these things to match up. So uh, I run this e function, and if that, if that returns true, and I'm in the main function. So if that succeeds, um, then indeed I can apply A, the payload of my first dynamic, to be the payload of my second. And I have to do all if I leave this step out, I don't check that the argument has the right type. I get a compiler. It could not deduce that A1 equals A2. So we could look down there and figure out those are the, the types of GHC assigned to the GHC. That's right. Uh, you can go through the main of the next part of the um, and, and so this is really a type safe thing that I'm doing, even though it's a type that has the type that's still there. Yes, so, so I call that an existential type. Um, and, uh, and that's essentially because it has this type variable A. It doesn't appear over here. Normally, whenever we have a type variable to use, it's in a data type, it has to appear in the result. Um, 
but it's very close. And so it means that when whenever we pattern that um, a dynamic, we should get more type information. And we don't know anything about that type, so we have to have the pattern mapping on that tie wrap to sort of narrow down the type of thing. Let's see, what's next? Um, okay, this is the um, So, uh, so what I want to do now is sort of walk through the, the you know, and talk about this is sort of the correspondence between types of terms. And you can actually make this correspondence really tight to use this thing called synthesis. Um, and, um, and we'll see sort of how that, how that goes as, as I develop it. There's actually not, probably not, I don't think large enough to go through the this work. Um, and, and for now, I'm just going to have to sort of say there is good motivation for this. We will see that motivation, but I'll say, you know, it's sort of usually dependent on motivation in the natural technique. So we do this for, and there's a good motivation for it. Um, and, and so what I want to do is, is I want to do the simplest possible thing in using program And that is to think about natural numbers. Sorry, so natural numbers are either zero or of course the successor of some natural numbers. Um, and um, and then, as I as we've seen, we can take data types and we can use them in types. So I want to make this new data based on the index. So far, um, so, so what is this S that I've created? So I'm calling it singleton type as a basic terminology, it's a family of singleton types. So I'm just going to continue to call it singleton type. This is the description. The idea when I say singleton, what I really mean is that if you tell me that I have S at zero, then I most certainly have S zero. Right? There is no other element. Let me ignore undefined. Uh, there is no other element of S at zero. If I had S at of two, right, which is soft touch, then the only possible element I could have is S of S sub S. Uh, and so this is being a very tight correspondence between this chunk of data and the type. And so when I learn exactly what chunk of data I have, I also know exactly what type. Um, and so we can move on to things. Um, so for example, let's say I want to be able to define addition to the things. So I'm going to move on the bus. So we're going to move using that. Uh, that means I'll go to the one case. Uh, some singles in that are uh, called n, one ten, and then this. Well, let's get that. And so we'll do sort of a straightforward representation. And so this this just implements addition over and over. Uh, okay, the problem with this is that I have to write something in return time. So if I take two singleton maps and right, add them together, well, the resulting type has to be some sum of n and m at the type level. Um, otherwise, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing I can put in that dot, dot, dot. Right here, in the zero case, the result is going to have type s and that m. But in this Successor case, uh, we need something more interesting. So now I have to and so you just write this in much the same way.
So, so what's going on here, the only way that you can get this last one to type check is to have our terminal operation request it in types. And then somehow that was managed to be from the fact that we're talking about these things. Right? If the term and the type are always sort of the same, then we really better make sure that we're always the And so one cool thing that you can do at this point is you can actually start doing uh, proofs, which I'll sort of put in quotes, and I'll refine what that means by that minute, um, about natural numbers and passing. So this might be something that you know, those of you who have programmed in you know, the real potential type languages can do in the real world. We can do this in so we can say the plus is associated. Um, so we can be N, N, and P, of course, is what our other one is. Um, and what I want to say, well, I want to say that if N plus N plus P is equal to So I'll need that data about kind of all the things in that validation step. Okay, I haven't gone on yet. Um, we can actually say something like that in Haskell that I think is pretty cool. Um, we can have an extra time. Um, oh, But how can we do this? Well, we have to do a little bit of pattern matching. So let's say that M is actually zero. We do that with pattern matching with zero. Um, when you were successful. Yes, that works. So I've got a warning in case I'm missing this. But that's okay. So if I know that M is zero, then HC can do a little reasoning and figure that out. So if I know M is zero, then you look at this type family definition up here, and the type family says, well, if we have zero on the left, I can simplify. And so then this left hand side just becomes n plus p. On the right, well, n is zero, so m plus n becomes just n, and then I'm left with n plus p. Yay! Okay. So type checks. And in this other case, we're going to get something like that. And now here, right, if we were doing sort of, if we weren't in Haskell, we wouldn't have at this point. Um, we would think, well, let's do an inductive proof. Well, we can do that in Haskell. What do we do? That's just a, it's a recursive function. So I need to look, I, I need to figure out, oh, well, is this plus associated for M prime and N and P? And if it is, well, then surely it's associated for N and P. Aha, of course. So I've proven that this, this type family is associated. Uh, and so, on the one hand, I mean, some of you are saying, well, why did that ever Well, it turns out that it is actually useful in the real program. On the other hand, I hope a bunch of you say, that's really cool, right? So it's a good use in that regard. Uh, and uh, so I'll admit that associativity happens to be really easy to prove in this way. Other things aren't quite as easy. Um, you know, you can get more curated to, to sort of be, to be somewhat useful or something. Um, but you can do this with more complex problems. Um, yes. So I just can't hear you. If you if you just got rid of the state, then you don't have to. Oh, so just just add a recursive problem. Wait, it looks like I should be able to do that because I'm just getting rep off and I'm producing another one. Um, and let's see what happens when I try. And the reason is, is that yeah, it comes out the wrong type because this is a proof now that that M prime and N and P are sort of have that, that known equality. 
And so we sort of need to unpack that proof and learn that in some people rebels, even though they're written the same, actually have they're, they're of different types. Yes, exactly. Um, so you do need to do that. Um, it's also worth noting that we actually need to have, even though there's only one constructor in our call we need to have the right constructor. Um, because otherwise there might be any harm or something like that. And so we need to have the right And so, so when I started down this road, we can have a proof um, that addition is, is associated. And the reason it's not a real proof is because Haskell doesn't check all of these things that the other contributors check on this. So, for example, um, you know, instead of Rebel, I could have written under the fine. And that's still going to type check. So clearly that's wrong. Um, and so maybe that's an easy one to eliminate. Well, so clearly just don't. But the other thing you can do is accidentally just have an infinite version. And in a really simple proof like this, um, it's, it's easy to avoid that. But in more complex proofs, you can end up doing that, and it will look like you have a proof that you don't. Um, and so this is, this is a proof that to know it's true, you have to work. Um, it's a little bit of um, And so one thing that uh, that I want to have in the future, this is not actually my direct research, but is to actually have a termination checker uh, in Haskell just for optimization purposes. Right? Because right now, to prove that these things are associated, you have to have a run in the run time to see if it's in the code. Um, but, but that's really silly. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So the termination checker would be necessarily anything. Um, so the goal would be that everything it says is terminating is usually is terminating. If it would determine anything that it's not. Right. But because this, the idea of using termination checker would be an optimization, it would be in that funny case, not your program is run, but maybe it's not quite as good as it could be. Or maybe we'll have, you know, you know unsafe by a surface is terminating. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so so any trivia with the Haskell. So there's work being done at um, uh, UC San Diego, uh, which is based on all liquid Haskell. It does have information. Um, and there there are a couple of sort of these mismatch problems that we can't take advantage of that today. But all of this technology is wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm in regular contact with that team. It will motivate to all the time. Okay, so so that's pretty cool that we can do all of that. We can see what's in this. Um, yeah, so let's see uh, an application. Well, first let's see a non So I want to have a type that stores numbers mod sum. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm doing some traffic program saying you have an integers mod soft. Um, and so we can do this using this data type and do this dynamically. The data type can store an integer and the modulus, and I can define this as num, which at every step of the way checks to make sure that the modulus are the same. Right? It doesn't make any sense to add some number mod 5 to some other number mod 7. These words shouldn't be really that much. Um, and so I can just check that all the time. This is slow and error prone and has error over it works. There's nothing sort of wrong with it, except that it does have an empty check. Um, and it's sort of my goal to get rid of that empty check two more times. And so I'm throwing this up as, as a reasonable idea of how to do this, but we can do this. Um, so let's look at what I call that. And so uh, this uses a little bit more of the singleton stuff than I actually built on this So let me get caught on that. So 
This is the same stuff we just saw. All the same stuff that we just saw. Um, the new stuff can be here. Um, so first we see that I have a uh, kind of greater than operation on these type level uh, numbers. And I'm using a straight times extension so I can actually look at that as a class constraint to assert one number greater than another. Um, Haskell doesn't have any way of saying no. So the closest thing I can say is that false is true. Right? I, want, I want some constraint that I know we have to be satisfied. Here, in the case of sub n versus zero, that's always true. And so that's just the empty constraint, which is you know, always satisfied. Um, in the, world of zero. the other piece of this that's, that's new here is this S net i. I and the i here is sort of implicit. Um, and this essentially allows you to pass these single things around implicit. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to sort of go through the details of this in coming, um, but uh, you can take a look at it later. Um, the, other, the other piece of this uh, that we will need is a way to convert these singleton numbers to sort of real logic numbers. And again, this is pretty straightforward. Right? It's not really using it. Okay, so we put all of that in hand. Now, I've made my, my Z model a new type of resident interest. So it's just passing around the actual number of the paragraph, not the model. But we have a, an index on the Z model type that says what the model is. And so here, in, in my num class, I, what I'm saying over here is that we need the modulus to be greater than zero. Right? This is the absolute answer we have on the And this is also saying that we need to know what this is at the bottom line. But we don't need to sort of pack it up and get it type it. It can just sort of float around like a class to the or a class to the um, And each time we need, to need that little piece of information, we can pull it out by using the SMAP method of the, of the same I class. Again, the detail, I don't think it's in the details right now, although I mean, it's not a whole lot of code. Um, but just this idea that we can have this type index which then should come into the right one. And so this is compiled, of course. And so I can do one thing that I can apply for six. So, uh, I'd love to just be able to write, say, the number four here. But of course, this is index five. I'm rewriting that for that because I've got all sorts of errors. And so I can show you a function that I call u, which is unary, it works, and then we can do that. So I can do that, and it actually works. So I make sure I work from 5 plus 6 1 4 is 3. Um, and in fact, if I try to take you know, 5, let's say, on 7, and add that to 6, uh, 3, let me get that. Um, because it doesn't make any sense to add two numbers to this model. So, so this is sort of one application of the singletons. Um, although it turns out you don't need the full power of singletons. And just for convenience, I also want to show one last version of this. Uh, it doesn't do that. It doesn't depend on any other of my modules. Uh, it uses JC built in type this. Um, and you know, I don't want to get into the details of the encoding right now, but this does the exact same. So this I think is a really useful way of thinking about the model of that if you have it in the program. Now you just it, it, it makes some things quicker and faster. You can don't need to pass around these modules everywhere. It's a very good first dynamic version. And it makes things more safe because we can take our right edge and things like that. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, yes. I'm just wondering, do things get slower if you use really big pods? Uh, like, does it take a lot longer to compile or something? Um, with my version, I'm sure the answer would be yes. With this version, probably not. It's using the built in non modern pods. Um, it's pretty slow down at one time. If it's slow down, you're definitely going to compile. Yes. Um, going back to the, uh, the previous example, uh, when you put in undefined and still type checked. Uh, 
you said that uh, you need to run it in order to prove that it's you're just excluding bottom by by running it. Yep. Do you need to do you need to do that for the entire uh, range of or the entire domain of the the function that you're? So it depends on the actual application. So, so, so the question uh, was, you know, do you have to run it as sort of every number in your domain to sort of have that proof? And you need to run it at every number or every triple of numbers that you care about at that moment, which in general is just one at a time, one at a time. Um, and so we'll see that we'll see examples of using these proofs. Other questions? Okay, so um, I, I have an example here, and I'll, I'll sort of show you that I'm looking at the clock here, um, and we won't just go over this thing. But I thought this was pretty cool, and I wanted to show it. It you can actually define um, a, a quick check operator that just can compare functions and sees if these functions are essentially if for any arbitrary arguments, they will be the same by doing random testing. Um, and so, you know, instead of being an awkward case for those examples, here's a way you can use dependent types to um, actually have better quick check properties. And so, here I have function slot and slot 2. Um, and they're very similar, except in one weird case. And so, I can click on quick check. Well, no, they don't. Um, and the interesting thing here, at this point, is that you can see that. But I can just take that. I can just sort of compare the functions directly and think about all the rest. Um, and so, again, it's sort of leveraging the um, uh, Haskell type system to do the same thing. Um, let's see, so I have two more things that cost me. And, and this is sort of a big monstrous example. I'm not going to explain it all other than the fact that it is possible. And so this is independently type merge sort. Um, and so if you um, say you have a big application that's not independently type in Haskell, you have this one part of it which is really sensitive, and you want to sort of have an extra guarantee to just this one part, you can do that without affecting the rest of the code. And so, I'm going to scroll a little bit at some point to show you that. But the bottom line, down here at the end, ignore that horrible definition of the type, but look at the type. That's a nice type. Right? It takes <laughs> integers to integers, and yet it's using an independently type implementation of merge sort. And if I had made a mistake in, it would not take it. Um, and here it goes. So, there's absolutely uh, so what, what this entails, so, so to do that takes a fair amount of work, right? So here, instead of having, I want this to be able to be anything that could be ordered, um, but I need a special word constraint. And not only do I need a compare operation, but I need a whole bunch of information about this compare operation if I'm going to be able to prove anything. So I need to know that if compare returns e, that in fact the two types that's the important thing that I'm doing my proof. You need to know that if, 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 compare, if compare AB returns less than, and compare BC returns less than. You need to know that compare AC will return less than. You need to know that that is also true of greater than. Of course, that's going to depend on the previous. You need to know that if I compare AB and that could be less than, if I switch it and hit the A, then that's going to be greater than. And the other way around. And so, it means that if I want to use this, I have to do all of these proofs about comparison functions. But if you, if you step back, that, that makes sense. We're not going to be able to prove a sort operator correct unless we know the sort of the fundamental comparison operation is. Um, and, and then there's some other stuff, and some other stuff, and a lot of other stuff. And so in here, I have a definition of this escort for my map one type, where I actually have. All of these proofs. Um, the interesting thing that happens here is that I call this function log from GHC. Um, it turns out that GHC is a little silly. Now let's see if I have my compile this. 
we made a pattern match for non exhaust Because here, this compare E, um, right, I haven't taken into account the possibility that maybe the first parameter is zero and the second parameter is sus. Right? You can see I only have two pattern matches and it doesn't compute. But, if I try to write that, and quite sensibly, you have errors in inaccessible code. Um, you probably can't be why you get that. Well, this, this case isn't too hard. The type of compare E asserts that, that comparing the type, that, that these types are in fact equal, that calling the parameter types returns the key. And so, of course, I have a suck and a zero, I'm not going to get that. And so, the premise isn't satisfied, the HCA works. What's annoying here is that if I write a line of code, I get an error. If I write a line of code, I get a one. And this is a, bug, is a well known bug in HC. The ticket starts as only 3,000, it's roughly 9,000. No one has gotten a difference in this. But it's becoming more critical because it's really hard to test this type of bug in HC. So this bug in HC is just a squashy one. Um, but I tested them on this. You can just write that. I have any questions. Okay. Yes. So, sort of that file, is there like a you know, definition of like sorted somewhere? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so, we have all that stuff, and then I have arbitrary and just using Chris character to solve. And this is my video using Chris character to make that code. And then there's another, another word instance. So, here is. I think what we're looking for. Um, so I do this by using uh, a list that's indexed by its minimum element. But because I have an empty list, I need to sort of affix an extra possibility on any type which is with top. Um, so you can't get it with top on the screen at the same time. But it's, it looks just like the main type. It just gives you one more value called top. And, and so here in the data, so the empty list has no minimum. Let's just say that this is minimum is essentially positive empty. Um, and then in the times case, I want to make sure that the new value I'm putting on is less than the minimum of the list that I'm upside down in and the times. Um, and so that type is, is fairly simple. Um, what, what becomes complicated and very wrong in how we do algorithm was Two word lists, which converts a normal list into one of these word lists. Um, and, and the key detail here that turned out to be remarkably hard to convince the HC of is um, this is essentially assuming a, a merge sort in that it takes this, this uh, input list, splits into two lists, and then merges them back together. That's why it's kind of a type merge sort. And we need to know that that splitting operation preserves the numbers, which, of course, it preserves the numbers. But it turns out that it's very hard to convince you to see it. So I had to write this very good proof um, to do that. And it's up on the GitHub repo. You can look at it. To get this to work, I actually had to rewrite all of this in pop and do the proof there. And then transliterate that proof back in the house because it is destroyed. The so point of this isn't necessarily this is a great idea to do it this way now, except if you do want to have this proof in code in your hassle for code base today, it is possible. Again, I'm trying to sort of just show the existence of this. This is possible. It's not easy or fun, yeah, but it's possible. I put up these as a um, uh, Not saying it's a genius idea, it's an achievement of a random source. Um, questions? Yes. Yeah. So is it more likely that you would make a mistake in your proof or just in the normal implementation of the merge sort? The proof is checked. And so the way I the way I could make a mistake in my proof is if I accidentally had an intended proof. That would be sort of the only easy way to do it, or unless like I accidentally typed on the top. Um, and it actually turns out pretty easy to avoid the intended proof because everything is nice and structural. And so you could do a fairly like I could imagine writing a template password program, for example, it would just have the structural proof. Um, and then I have pretty common. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so, so really, when you're doing all this stuff, basically what it amounts to is you have a regular computation, you have a federal computation, and then you have some correspondence between type values and computation, right? So the 
seems like the runtime company has all the money. Where the hard part is for the box. That I do look at this. Yeah, 
This is both. I'm going to try to do this. Okay, so with that, let's take a 10 minute break, I think. Um, and then this is the second part of the system, sort of the first. And then we'll resume at. <coughs>
So, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of technical stuff. What all this does. It's an interesting thing. You have to see those. Um, this is using sort of a built in Singleton library, which generates a lot of stuff for us. Um, uh, and what, what this is really about, this example, and this is again, this is so that you might see, is you have a length index vector. Uh, so we have this vector right here at the top of the screen that keeps track statically. Um, and uh, we have this replicate function, which you can take a value and repeat it so many times that you don't have to do it. And so that's all well and good. And then down here, what I want to have is I want to have a list of vectors, perhaps of different levels, and I want to be able to compact them. Um, and so, of course, if I have a list of vectors of different lengths, to have this be well typed, I need to keep track of all the different lengths. So, this, this list, I can get into this type of evidence. And the idea is that I'm storing a type level list of the length of all the different elements in the list. Um, again, looking at the high levels, you're not the detail. Um, but I can, I can build one of these things. Um, I have to have n on vectors, and of course, like n two vectors, then the result, the length of the result has to be the sum of those things. And then I can have me, I'm going to want to compute the sum, which is just holding the plus sign. And so we can do this today using some power from the sequence of variables to promote functions to um, type things. And so there's this promote thing that you see on line 34. That's just some template of actual stuff. It goes over the code that I've written there and promotes all the type things. Um, and so there's a library called singleton that's not happy with all of those. Um, but that's somehow I'm happy to have these things. So, so this is what I want that code to look like. Um, of course, if I compile that, you know, of course it's simple to do. But, but someday, we're not going to have a code. Um, and uh, the meta type is, is mostly the same as the last one. So this one's actually indexed by real integers instead of this, this funny math type that I'm going to do. Um, because it's not. Um, uh, here we see right here, uh, as well as I see down here, that we can just take term level things and promote them to the type level with a tick mark. Um, much like right now, those of you who played around the data kind, you know, you can take data constructors and promote them to the type level with a tick mark, which is extending that. Yes? I thought we wanted the events to be indexed by NAT so that they wouldn't be negatively sized. Sure, we, we can have that if we want. Okay. Um, but I, I chose to do it by using the theory of maybe that's fine for a few more years. So then the other interesting thing is now we have this new type of replicate. So let me bring up the other slide. And so what, what this is, this is a new thing instead of for all. So it's syntactically just like for all. But it's the pi. Pi bound. And something that's pi bound is available both in types and in terms. And, and that's sort of understanding that sentence is what the rest of, of the product is. It's just doesn't pack that for me. It analyzes on this in type and in time. And so what, what I mean here is that this n is in types because I can mention it later in the type. That's the root of the term type uses n. But it's also in terms because I can pattern that on it down to um, So the other funny thing that you see here is this at sign that I'm using. And that's because normally uh, one of these pi bound things would be inferred. Um, but I actually want to make it explicit in terms. So I knew that it's intact, but we can use an at sign. So it overrides the, the implicit nature of that from the letter. Um, and, and so so this is what I want the replicate of the future to look like. And without all of this syntax, and this is this considerably simple. No template possible, no extra library that you need to do. Okay, so let's, let's jump back to Kino. Um, so uh, right away, I do want to say, right, as I'm, as I'm thinking about extending Haskell, all your old Haskell programs will still be. Um, 
except for things that use less generalized of kinds. There is a paper entitled Lunch of Kinds of Generalized, and actually a few years ago, uh, JC became a little bit finicky about that generalization. No one noticed because no one knows this. Um, and now I'm going to do the same trick I modeled and again, no one knows. Um, but the key fact here is that um, termination is not going to be required. Um, and so people would be kind of saying, oh, let well, us not make your language inconsistent, and then we can prove false and things. Sure, we can. We can prove false in that. So that's no problem with that. We have them to We have general terms. We're okay with them. Um, and so it means that you won't be writing proofs in Haskell in a mathematical sense. But you'll still be able to use dependency set program. And maybe GHC might prove that you're not But better GHC prove sometimes. And then when it, when it actually succeeds, you know your program works. Um, so, so that's the that's thing. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit and then say actually what's going to happen. Um, so this change is all about the quantum part. So a quantifier is something that introduces the function um, And right now, it has three different quantifiers. It has for all, which introduces sort of a type level function on you. We have arrow, one of the these two. And double arrow, which introduces, it's a sort of, sort of term level argument, but it's, it's invisible. We don't actually know what has to be. And looking at these, you can ask four different questions about quantifiers. And the quantify is the quantifier. Um, so is the quantify e relevant? Is it dependent? Is it visible? And is the quantification required at all? And so the next four slides will define the answers. The quantify e is relevant if it can be used in a relevant context. So that's sort of the back of the definition there. Um, but uh, with an example, I think maybe they're going to get into some relevant clarity. So for all is an irrelevant quantifier, the two arrows are relevant. So the first order, you can think of this as a round at runtime, or it doesn't quite tell what it's So in this case, I, V is for all quantifier. Um, but the first, this first clue doesn't make any sense. I can't then take not V. Right? That's wrong. You can't then use V in a term. And that's because V is a compile time thing only. And we can't then return it at runtime. That's that would make it wrong. We don't want to do that. Um, but this is okay, we can still mention V as long as it's to the right of the double call. But this is using scope type variable, we can do that. Whereas with, with arrows, we can always use an arrow down the margin of the um, The reason I say it's not exactly the same thing as erasability is because we want this idea of relevance also in type channels. And because all types are erasable, then it doesn't make sense to talk about erasability. It's just slightly different than so it's really going to be. But in terms of the same. Um, so there's dependence. So this is whether or not the quantify E can be used later in the time. So for all is dependent, and the other are non dependent. So here, foo, that makes good sense, right? I can use A later in the type. And, and down here with bar, well, you, you can't do that. I mean, you, you know, even when I see that, I have a hard time even person what that means exactly, right? The key is sort of function. Um, we know we just know we can't use um, We can't use the little bit of so. well, The next question we can ask is visibility. And, and all visibility is, is do we need to actually write the thing in our code stuff? Um, so arrow is visible. We need to write arrow arguments in our code stuff. But we can leave type arguments out in any dictionary. And so the example here is, in, in foo, um, when, I, when I call foo or I define foo, there's nothing to the left of my equal sign. I'll just say foo because both the for all bound B argument and then the same I dictionary, those are both implicit or invisible. Um, whereas in R, I have a, a visible kind of C, and I actually have to mention the call C and then find it. Um, so, uh, so we have this. The reason I go digital and visual, I often think of it as implicit versus explicit, but evidently there's people that have different meanings attached to those words, and so uh, at least here you see the words. Um, and then the last is requirement. If we want an arrow bound identifier, we need to actually mention that in the type. We don't need to write the word for all in the type, that's just inferred. Um, 
on using uh, the computer. So we kind of don't write the word for all that computer code. Because that's all it requires. Um, so let's sum all of this up. So for all the secure world, it is dependent. It's indivisible. We don't have to put type arguments in to really refer to the implementation. And it's not required to do inversions in the secure world. Um, and you can see through the secure world, we have different distinctions. Um, so under visible, when we have a double R argument, that's inferred by solving. Right? You sort of look around for instances which show different algorithms of unification. So that's what we're seeing. In room programs add up the differences of single braces versus the double braces. So you're going to go up and go into it. Awesome. Love you. Uh, okay. I'm going to expand this list. Um, and so the big new thing in this is that now we have pi. Um, and it turns out that sometimes we're going to want pi to be visible and sometimes invisible. Uh, and so we're also going to have modification that in the for all syntax you have a for all and then a bunch of things and then a dot. But we're going to generalize that and you have a dot there or an arrow. Arrow means visible, dot means visible. So this is a conservative extension of what we have today. But the interesting thing here is that the two high rows are both relevant and dependent. So it means you can use it later in the type and you can use it in the term. Uh, and, and, and we'll see sort of another example of the next slide of the work. But that's the new interesting thing about the uh, For completeness, it also seems to make sense to have for all arrows. It's unclear whether or not we will ever use it. Right? When we call the aid function, we will have to pass in the type. Maybe. Um, and so people want that to be happy. For all, I mean, for all arrows, that's just syntax. So, so let's see the example. Um, so this is a slightly re-formulated version of replicate, but I think it's a little bit more uh, perspicuous than the one uh, we saw earlier. Uh, so this is the same exact type that we saw in today's example. And here in replicate, I'm going to use for all to bind the A, because I don't want to have to worry about what my element type is in my type. I don't want to have to pass that in this list. I just want this to be inferred. But my pi value inquire, I'm using the arrow here. And my syntax however in my slide is intentional. This arrow is, is not really the function of it. It's a, it's a piece of special syntax related to the pi. It just happens to be spelled the same as the real function of it. It's like first meaning. Uh, right, so green meaning type, blue is keywords, and white is keywords. Um, so, um, so here, I'm pattern matching on my value for x, and that's a zero in itself. <laughs> but I'm also using minimal proof. So this pi dot identifier is exactly the same thing as using single trace. Pi n is the same as for all n single trace. Um, but now it's built in, it's actually even kind of much more efficient. Because the single trace require sort of conversions back and forth. And single things to regular types. So it's um, and so that's really all we're really doing. Okay, this is just adding type on type. And that will, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, it turns out the implementation is a little harder than that, but that's, that's what it's about. Yes? No, you can find this. So the question is, can you pi quantify it for anything? The answer is yes. Um, there's nothing special about max. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. So if you don't know that number at compile that time, you can read that in from the user one time. And then call replicate. Um, and it just means that at, at 
during the compilation loop is going to have some unknown variable n, which is the length. But as long as it's sort of the same everywhere, it you obeys know, all of the rules that we've set out in our different types. So you have a choice. The way I've written here with the power is the color of other pieces would have to pass it in, even though it can be inferred. It's sort of um, But in some cases, it's only can be inferred by the return type. And so maybe by making it explicit, now we have voice type of um, And so it's a, it's a designer's choice. I could replace that arrow with a dot, and then it would be Um, okay, so there's a couple other different knock on effects of this. Right now, Haskell has a separate type system from his kind system. Um, and I want to go away with that and make type and kind the same. Um, so that means that everything that you do in types, you can do in kinds. Um, so that means the type system can work in kinds, which is something I personally really love that you can't have kinds in there. Uh, we can have kind families, because kind is the same. We may even promote that. Right now, so I've used some sort of data types at the time level, while well, there's limits to that, and I want to get rid of all of them. Um, it turns out this piece I've already implemented, and it works on my work. Um, so that's how it works. Um, <laughs> so we have it. Uh, and another effect of this is that now, if we want, we can have kind variables explicit. So here I have a poly kind of data type T. And today I have to be up with K, but here what I've done right is I have this, this kind K, and then B is a kind K, and then GGC can infer that A actually has to be a kind K out of star. And this is all of course. I gotta get my branch up here because I didn't compile it. It will not apply. It says for all, it's wrong. Oh, no, you can do it. Absolutely. Yeah, because that will know the end of that. So if I don't want to leave off that application, absolutely. Just say pi. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, you can, you can do it in order. The pi could come first if I wanted to. But I'm not sure you can't maybe have the other solutions that I was talking about. Um, so for all of these out there, there's a paper I see a few last year that outlines exactly how it's going to work. And it turns out the implementation is really not just the paper, but it's really the story. Um, so um, we're talking about this is, this is implemented and we <coughs> Um, okay, there's still a bunch of other questions about all of this. Um, so, you know, what do, that, what do you do about it? You know, if you want to promote something that has a constraint, you can promote dictionaries, and you can do that. Um, right now, type families have to be saturated. What are we going to do with that? Termination really talks a little bit about the other sources of, of the value checking. The good news about all of the answers to questions is that you can handle them one at a time. Um, and so, you can have this whole thing working, and even if you haven't addressed any of these, there's still a lot of useful stuff that you can do. And you can choose which question you want to hit next. Do that. And then each one looks like a conservative thing. So I think it's okay that you want to do that. Um, so let me tell you what, 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 what you can have. I think there's some of you have seen um, the core language. The, 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 the case you have is tight core language. That is mostly done. Um, all of the stuff for the universal promotion. That's all done in the core language that was done in the year and a half ago, actually. And and Hotsides is still working its way through. Um, so right now, in, in that branch where we try to compile it, you know, file that one definition of the policy that I think is really about the um, Type inference, uh, I worked out an algorithm on paper. Um, I have partial proof that it's correct. There's nothing to talk about it, but it's just straight out of time. Paper that I have, and I don't have to. It's all roughly in progress. 
And so, so that's it's coming along just fine. Um, the implementation is coming along just fine. And uh, like I said, I'm um, very much on the way to the interesting thing here is I you know, want to keep typing for some nice theoretical problem with type notes, which is something that's only been definitely um, so, uh, so next steps. Um, I, I want to merge the type equals time stuff um, in the master. Um, it turns out to refer to earlier so that you know we want to be able to do these sorts of equality in the cloud Haskell. Um, the cloud Haskell thing might be pushing me to merge this even sooner, which is great. Um, because I have not had to engage in on probably a long and, and, and vigorous debate with Simon about the original um, He's quite aware of everything that's going on, and it's just sort of being slow to write a while, not quite getting the things that he was doing. Um, anyway, so that, that's going to happen. Hopefully, it's for 712. That would be not 714. Um, and then all the five stuff that more likely is 714, and then you know that's how we're going to do and then there's some weird parsing issues. And then we'll have to take cut and we'll be done. And probably at the same time, I will grab a little bit. As I said, this is essentially a musical. Um, and that's it. And I'll be having us six and a half minutes to call. Thank you so much.